What's up, YouTube? It's Advent of Code Day 2. Twitch wanted me to put in some auto tunes, so there you go. Hope you enjoy this. Today's problem is about rock, paper, scissors. Before we begin, why don't we just play one game against each other? Are you ready? On rock, paper, scissors, shoot as well. Not just rock, paper, scissors, then you do rock, paper, scissors, shoot. Okay, ready? Rock, paper, scissors, shoot. I chose rock. I think I won. Comment below what you chose and see if you won. In today's advent of code, it's primarily centered around rock, paper, scissors with a slight twist that different moves get different amounts of points. Part one and part two, the difference is that the scoring is different. I don't want to focus too much on the problem today, but instead I want to just show you a few neat tricks that I used and learned in OCaml, and we're starting to expand sort of our vocabulary within the language. The primary things that we're going to be using today are modules, and we're going to practice a little bit more functional style programming. We're not going to write any loops. In our previous day's solution, we often exposed sort of this pattern of accumulator from a base function, but through some help from YouTube comments and some people on Twitch, I found out that a more common strategy, particularly in OCaml, is you can define some function that has a larger scope, and then within that function, you write yourself a little recursive helper. This way, if you need to start with a different initial value or you want to change the structure or style of this accumulator, you can do that without having to break any of the consumers of your API. So now you'll see this pattern many times as we work through OCaml solutions for advent of code, where we write some inner function or helper or something similar that does all of the work. And then you call that basically with the initial seed value. In part one of advent of code, you're given a problem statement where each line is a letter, a space, and then another letter. On the left, we have A, B, and C, representing rock, paper, scissors. And on the right, we have X, Ys, and Zs, which for part one, represent rock, paper, scissors. For part one, we didn't do anything too interesting with the type system, but I do want to show you how we can do some really pretty things with match statements that make sure that we're covering all the cases and really make it quite easy to come back to the code later and read them. So our part one solution looks like this. We start by converting their letters, A, Bs, or Cs, to X, Y, Z. The reason I did this was because it was a lot easier to reason about X always meaning rock, Y always meaning scissors and Z always meaning paper or whatever combination of those that we wanted to do. And so I transformed theirs into our letters. What you'll notice for these matches is that we have a case and then we have the result and we have another case in the result, another case in the result. And then we have to have this basically fallback case, which says, hey, anything else assert false. I wrote it this way so that I would know if there was any input that I didn't expect. In the part two solution, I'll actually show you how we can get rid of all these fallback cases and write much prettier code using enums and types available to us with OCaml. But for part one, we aren't ready for that yet. So after we've converted the value into X, Y's, and Z's and gotten our value, we get one point for playing X, two points for playing Y, and three points for playing Z, and there are no other options. So we assert false. But now what's cool is we're going to use the match statement to compare their play versus our play. And so in this case, what we have here is we have several different cases. And actually, when you see multiple pipes in one case, that just means this is sort of like saying this or this or this do this. OK, so that's what that pipe means in this case. And what we can see is when they play X and we play Y, that means we've won. And when they play Y and we play Z, that means we've won. And when they play Z and we play X, that means we've won. Whenever we win, we get six points. In the case where we both play the same item, we get three points. And all the other cases that are left are zero points because we've lost. So then to solve and score part one, we simply add the played value and the resulting value to get our score for that round. With that, we just plug that scoring function into our scorer, and then we'll get the result for part one. Part two, things get a little bit more interesting. For part two, X, Y, and Z no longer playing rock, paper, scissors, but they instead represent what outcome you want to happen from the turn, which means that X means we need to lose, Y means we need to draw, and Z means we need to win. And so now this means that X, Y, and Z need to respond to whatever was played by the other player. 
But I found this a little too difficult to reason about with ABCs and XYZs because I literally couldn't keep track of everything in my head. I started exploring making new types. And so let's show you how we did that and then how we use those to quite elegantly solve part two. These new modules, we can actually associate different functions with them and write what I think ends up being a very succinct and easy to read solution. So what we do is we convert the string to either rock, paper, scissors, and then we say what our outcome needs to be by turning the rest of the string into an action. And now we're going to match on the outcome. So that, remember the outcome is either loss, draw, or win. And if we have a loss, then we're saying, hey, RPS, what is the get losing move or the losing move for their move? We go to the definition and what we see is that we can match move with rock. Okay, well then the losing move is to play scissors. The losing move for paper is to play rock and the losing move for scissors is to play paper. This is so much easier to read than say just X, Y, A's, B's, and C's, right? I, I was getting so confused, that's why I actually moved to this. We also know now that we've handled all of the different cases, right? Because this, if we didn't have something, like if we didn't have the paper solution, OCaml will actually tell us, hey, this pattern matching is not exhaustive. So if we added a new style of move, let's say we added a new style of move, which would just be like lick keyboard, maybe you're the primogen. Then you're going to see that each of the places that we had previous match statements no longer are exhaustive. So this helps us make sure that we're keeping track of every possible state and variant within our system. So with that knowledge, you can see that once again, we're matching the different outcomes. So if we have a loss, then we're going to get the losing move. It's if it's a draw, we have to play their same move. And if it's a win, then we have to get the winning move. Once we've done that, we find out now what our move is and we can add the points of whatever the outcome of the match is, so win, loss, or draw, and the points for playing our particular move. Once we've done that, we just pass it back to our scoring function, and then voila, out comes the right answer. Simple, elegant, easy breezy, OCaml. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you'd like to see more, smash the like button, give it a subscribe, you know, maybe even come and hang out on Twitch with us. That's where we're recording this video right now. Thanks everybody and I'll see you in day three.